Good morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, we're excited to get started. Um, we have about two minutes and then we'll begin right on time. So thank you all for waiting and we look forward to, to today's presentation. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So on behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, welcome to the second session in our operator certification webinar series on collection systems. So my name is Avery Davis and I'm from the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. And before we begin, I'm gonna cover a few logistics and then we're gonna be, and then we'll get started. During the webinar today, everyone will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box anytime throughout the session. We will be saving your questions for a facilitated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. After the webinar, you will all receive a follow-up email that includes a link to the recording and other information you may need. You can also download the slides from today in the Handouts tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. This webinar has not been submitted for pre-approval of continuing education credits, but eligible attendees will receive a certificate of attendance for their personal record. To receive a certificate for this session, you must attend for the entire webinar and register and attend individually using your real name and unique email address. Certificates will be sent via email within 30 days of the webinar date. And if you have any questions or need assistance, please contact us at smallsystems at syr.edu. Now for a little bit about the Environmental Finance Center Network. We provide training and technical assistance to small public water and wastewater systems in all US states and territories. If your community or utility needs assistance with drinking water or wastewater system management, please feel free to contact us through our request form, which I will be sharing shortly in the chat. And on that note, I would like to introduce our presenter for today. So joining me is James Markham, who is a research engineer from the Southwest Environmental Finance Center. Um, and later on joining us for the Q&A today will be AJ Barney, a research scientist also at the Southwest EFC. So welcome James, and I hand everything over to you. All righty, let me get the right screen up here. Okay, so thanks, Avery. Uh, as she said, uh, I'm James and AJ Barney is with us today. We're both research engineers here at the Southwest EFC. And AJ is actually a level four wastewater operator who had a career at the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority prior to joining us here at the uh, Southwest Environmental Finance Center. And he's gonna be bringing uh, that practical experience to this webinar series, uh, both today and particularly in later discussions uh, and sessions when we talk about treatment techniques. Uh, and today uh, he's gonna be helping us with the Q&A if there is any at the end. So thanks for joining us, AJ. Um, 
Our topic today is collection systems. Uh, and this is going to be a brief overview of things that uh, you should be aware of and know for your op cert test. Um, you know, uh, wastewater's got to travel from your customers to whatever treatment facility you have, does that through the collection system. And of course, you know, we're not going to be able to cover every detail there is to know about collection systems in an hour. But the idea here is to give sort of an overview and touch on some of the more important aspects of collection systems that you're likely to need to know for your certification exam. <clears throat> And as always, we encourage you to review uh, state-specific study materials uh, that are available closely, as there may be some differences between sort of the typical construction in your areas uh, and what we discussed today. And there may be some you know, code differences as well that you have to have to be aware of. Um, our collection topics today um, sort of fall into six uh, areas, uh, cleaning and maintenance, lift stations, manholes, uh, maps and asbelts. Uh, piping and joints uh, and service connections. Um, we're going to go over them in a slightly different order, uh, but these are all subjects uh, that you should be familiar with, uh, both in your day-to-day -day work uh, and when it comes to actually sitting down to take uh, whichever level exam you are going to take, uh, understand the vocabulary, understand how these pieces fit together and their various functions. Um, but before we jump into that, I want to talk about some uh, basic design elements uh, you're going to need to know. Uh, even if your particular system doesn't have all of these components, one of the things we talked about in the last session was the fact that, you know, the OPSERT exam is really one of those examinations that you get to use uh, practical experience that you've accumulated on the job uh, on, you know, and uh, so many of the things that you run into on the exam are going to you know, be issues or, or uh, topics that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in your job. But again, uh, there's going to be uh, some topics that you may not be familiar with because the OPSERT exam, of course, is covering a broad range of possible uh, wastewater uh, treatment options and solutions. Uh, so, you know, you're going to have to know about standard treatment plants, even though you may only have lagoons, etc. cetera. But uh, for the collection systems, there's, there's a lot of commonality here. Um, so let's think of this as sort of basic uh, vocabulary terms or building blocks you need to know about how sewers are put together uh, so that you understand what they're talking about uh, in various questions. Typical wastewater uh, collection system is going to look something like this, where you've got a bunch of buildings uh, laid out in some sort of pattern in your area. Uh, and there are going to be individual service connections from those locations um, to uh, the main lines and ever increasing lines of lines of ever increasing size as they work their way toward the, the treatment plant. Um, you're going to start off with um, sewer lines, uh, customer lines going out to uh, your laterals uh, or branch sewers that are going to collect sewage from multiple buildings. Um, those might run down side streets or in alleys or be in the front, depending on how your system is set up. Uh, here in my particular neighborhood in Albuquerque, um, the, the laterals uh, run in the alleys behind houses. So they've got the water connection coming in from the front and the sewer going out of the back. Um, those laterals obviously um, have to go somewhere uh, and those are gonna move off to larger mains. So those are gonna flow into a larger set of mains, uh, which in turn will flow into larger trunk sewers, which will collect the flow from those laterals and branches. Uh, and take that uh, possibly to a lift station uh, through uh, intercepting sewers, which are essentially the, the largest lines that are going to the treatment facility. Now, for the side from the, the lift station there, everything I've talked about in this particular image is gravity fed, uh, but there are gonna be instances where you, know, you have neighborhoods that you're servicing that are uh, geographically at lower elevations than the wastewater treatment plant, so you've gotta lift uh, the sewage up uh, to get it to the to treatment facility. So you might have a completely separate neighborhood or one that's connected um, that'll have a lift station somewhere. Uh, and that may actually get out to your interceptor uh, through a force main. So a main that's under pressure. Um, so um, obviously not every neighborhood looks like this. Uh, and depending on the size of your particular utility, uh, you may have variations on this theme, uh, but that's sort of some basic uh, vocabulary terms to make sure that you understand, you know, the building sewer connections, the laterals, mains, trunks, lift stations, interceptors, and force mains, and, and what they do. Talking about gravity, uh, sewers in general, some sort of 
basic information to, to know about them. Uh, the slope of the pipe will typically follow the lay of the land where possible. Um, flow is designed for somewhere between two and eight feet per second, typically with about two and a half feet per second flow considered ideal, uh, and a minimum flow velocity of about two feet per second at average or peak flows. And the reason you have that is you wanna keep the pipes clean. That's often called the scouring velocity. That is uh, basically the, the flow that is gonna help prevent things from building up. Um, the sewers have to be designed for maximum expected flow or peak flow. Um, you may actually have a slightly oversized system if you are in an area that's been recently built and is expecting a lot of growth because the idea when they're doing the design work is to look for uh, a size that's gonna fit the maximum population density that uh, that area is gonna have when it gets developed. Um, so something to think about there is, you know, understanding what typical per capita flow in your jur jurisdiction is because volumes vary. You know, rural areas tend to be uh, lower than urban areas, but when the maximum flow happens is pretty uniform. That's typically between 10 and noon. Uh, you know, we all get up at varying times during the morning to get ready, go for, go to work, uh, do the laundry, do dishes, things like that. And so that, that morning flow works its way through the system and typically hits uh, wastewater treatment plants around midday. Um, just like you have to oversize the pipes to, to deal with peak flow uh, and your maximum population density, uh, you have to do the same thing with the wastewater treatment plant itself. The last thing you want is a plant that can only handle uh, the average daily flow. So you use a peaking factor uh, to design the size of the plant. It's typically gonna be somewhere between two and a half and three and a half times daily flow so that it can handle those fluctuations that are likely to occur. Uh, over the course of, of the year. A little bit more on sewer slope. Um, there's a function uh, or a relationship between uh, actual slope and the sewer pipe size. This happens to be taken from uh, Michigan uh, data. Uh, and they've got some rules there about the minimum slope that's gonna meet that two feet per second design flow minimum that they have. This is in particular related to mobile homes and seasonal mobile home park sewer design. But you'll notice that uh, the smaller the diameter of the pipe, the steeper the required slope you need to maintain that scouring velocity. So, you know, 1.2 feet over 100 feet for a four inch pipe, whereas, you know, a larger 14 inch main is, is much, uh, can work in a much uh, shallower slope. And that's basically just because there's a bigger volume of water moving through there to do that. Um, Again, design requirements can vary a little bit by jurisdiction and how flow is talked about can vary a little bit by jurisdiction or by type of sewer or what the sewer is serving. So for example, here in New Mexico where I am, uh, typical per capita flow is about somewhere between 60 to 125 gallons per day, sort of ranging from the lower, at the lower end in rural areas of the higher end in typical uh, urban areas. Um, the Michigan Mobile Home Sewer Park Guide design requirements um, talk about a maximum of 200 gpd or gallons per day per home site um, those look very different but they're actually probably fairly close uh, when you think about it because most homes are going to have more than a single occupant so it's good to to understand sort of the, the basic requirements and how uh, sewer flow is uh, looked at and calculated in your particular jurisdiction because it may be a little bit different. Um, so, you know, think about those design requirements in your jurisdiction uh, and, and pull those from uh, whatever uh, local study materials you have available. Uh, sort of general universal uh, design requirements are going to be available in sort of guides like the Sac State guides that I talked about in the last session uh, that basically provide a sort of uh, guide for general use uh, no matter where you're at. Other things to think about, um, particularly when you're adding on to uh, an existing sewer, you know, the pipes need to be sized for available cleaning equipment. Um, the sewers generally shouldn't on, only flow, should only flow, excuse me, half full uh, during average daily flows. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one, you wanna have room for error. You don't want gravity pipes being pressurized, but you also wanna maintain aerobic conditions uh, in the pipes. You don't want uh, you know, sewage to go septic while it's working its way to the plant because that can have a negative impact on your treatment facilities. So um, you know, the idea is to have sewage flowing at the bottom, airspace above uh, to maintain those aerobic conditions. Um, sewers here in New Mexico are typically four to eight feet deep, but this is again, a your mileage may vary kind of situation. They may be a lot deeper 
uh, in specific areas or in your state in general, just because of things like uh, weather differences. Um, you know, laterals and trunks and mains are typically in the center of streets. Uh, and this is really important because of contamination possibilities. Um, sewer mains are typically below and to the side of water pipes. And I think that's one of the reasons, for example, here in New Mexico, we've got the, the laterals running behind the houses. Um, it just helps keep things separate. Um, but typically it's two feet vertically below and four feet horizontally so that if there is any leakage, uh, you're not gonna contaminate water supplies. Um, Moving on to piping and joints, which is another important uh, category of information uh, that you need to know about, largely because there are often many, many kinds of pipe in any given system. You know, sewer systems tend to be around for a very, very long time and get built with whatever happens to be uh, the current uh, material in fashion. Uh, and you know, if you're working with that system, you have to understand the different materials that are in your system and how those materials uh, can and should be connected in a safe way. Um, typically, when pipe is selected, um, you're looking at some basic criteria, uh, resistance to deterioration, its ability to withstand surface loads, because again, they're often in the middle of streets, um, resistance to things like root intrusion, um, ability to minimize breakage, costs, and of course, their service lifespan. Um, of course, as I said, that's great if you're starting from scratch, uh, thinking about what you're gonna put into a new section, but most systems have been around for a while, so you have to know the basics about how those uh, pipe materials work, uh, what their kind of damage they're susceptible to, and how they should be connected. So let's shift a little bit into pipe materials. Um, typically what you're gonna see and what you're liable to be tested on are uh, a limited category. So asbestos, cement, pipe, reinforced and non-reinforced concrete, um, cast iron and ductile iron, vitrified clay, uh, fiberglass reinforced pipe, um, and then three different kinds of plastic that are typical. So ABS, HDPE, and PVC. Um, you can kind of break these up into four different categories. You got cement pipes, um, you've got metallic pipe, uh, you've got vitreous clay, which is kind of a category unto itself, uh, and various plastics. And each have positives and negatives. Uh, some are still currently used, some are pipe that you're only gonna sort of run into in a historical context when you're maybe doing repairs. Um, AC asbestos to pipe, uh, cement pipe was in vogue for a long time uh, for a lot of reasons. It's rigid, it's really resistant to deterioration by most uh, wastewater, but like most uh, cement-based pipes, it is subject to crown rot, which is corrosion uh, that happens when hydrogen sulfide um, combines with moisture in that open air part of the, the sewer uh, forms sulfuric acid, which can over time eat away at it. Um, its use is restricted by OSHA, obviously, because of the asbestos piece. Uh, you don't wanna be cutting that without a uh, PPE on. Um, and it's got unique joints. Typically, it's just straight sections of pipe uh, with sleeve and rubber gasket couplings. Um, other kinds of concrete pipe are reinforced and non-reinforced. Uh, concrete, you'll see these often for very large mains in the sewers um, because they're really, really strong. They're rigid, they can withstand really high surface loads. Um, also subject to crown rot, um, but uh, one way that that's mitigated is by lining them. Um, so they might have a plastic lining, they might be coated with epoxy on the inside, they might have a coal tar on them. Um, the joints in these, uh, as you can see in this picture here, um, are typically what's called a bell and spigot uh, joint where this is the spigot and it fits into this larger bell. And if you see, there's a little ridge right there, that's where the rubber gasket goes to, to, to seal the joint between the two. Um, but you might also run into situations where there's you know, bituminous material in there or a mortar uh, filling older joints um, because that's, you know, things have evolved over time. Um, moving on to metallic pipe, um, it's gonna be typically cast iron or ductile iron. Uh, it's really rigid resists high surface loads, it's very expensive. Um, here in New Mexico, the codes call for it to be used for bridge crossings and where the lines are very, very shallow. Um, joints are typically rubber gasketed or, or mechanical push-on joints, but for older installations, you might actually have what's effectively lead solder, you know, kind of like the copper pipes that you would uh, solder in your house where the joints are, are put together with, with uh, a lead material. Um, the picture you're looking at is kind of an oddball pipe uh, that I found. Uh, it's from a railroad crossing in Manchester, England. It's uh, rectangular, which is unusual just in general and was certainly unusual for its time. But um, it's an example of, of a metallic sewer pipe. 
uh, that you might run across. Shifting gears, vitrified clay. Um, you see this a lot in older service lines, but it's also used in, in smaller diameter pipes. Uh, it's really rigid, uh, but it is subject to cracking and, and root intrusion, particularly the older stuff that has mortar filled joints. Um, positives about it, resistant to acids and caustics and gas, it's essentially pottery. Um, nowadays, the joints are almost always bell and spigot, uh, and they'll typically have a factory installed uh, PVC or, or polyurethane compression uh, ring uh, in it. And you can see that in the picture here, the yellow uh, rubberized pieces there uh, essentially got the gasket built in, they slip together, and as long as they're, they're, they're held together, um, those perform uh, watertight seals. Um, Again, with older joints that you find, you might end up with you know, spigots that have mortar in them. Fiberglass reinforced pipe can come in a variety of diameters. Some of them are huge um, advantages. It's really corrosion resistant. Uh, it's somewhat flexible, uh, whereas most of the materials we've talked about before are not. Um, this will typically use uh, bell and spigot joints as well, as you can see in there, but some of these larger pipes uh, you can see are just straight. Um, one of the downsides of plastic and fiberglass pipes is that they are subject to failure from unanticipated surface loading. So they're not as strong as the cement uh, or vitrified clay pipes, um, particularly if they're not installed correctly. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, they might be subject to crown rot. The verdict's out on this. There's some indications that they are and some indications that they aren't. Um, time will tell. ABS uh, is a kind of plastic. Um, it's flexible, it's resistant to almost everything that you find in wastewater, except for petroleum products, which hopefully won't be in your wastewater, but petroleum products can soften and erode ABS pipes. Um, the joints are solvent welded, which also sort of shows you that, they, that the petroleum products can soften. It's kind of like the a larger version of the <clears throat> pipe you'd see in a sprinkler system uh, where there's solvent joints used there but there's also gasketed bell and spigot joints for there um, you have to be really careful with abs pipe um, particularly because if it's not installed correctly it can deflect into an oval shape uh, and that's really problematic you want the pipe to be round uh, so that the velocities are maintained um, hdpe is another kind of pipe <clears throat> It's often used for small diameter, uh, low pressure sewers and for uh, force mains and sometimes for house connections as well. Um, the joints in this are essentially thermally welded. They basically heat up both sides of the pipe and squeeze them together and that bonds. Uh, the nice thing about that approach is that you basically don't have any physical joints that can come apart. You end up with nice long uh, contiguous uh, pieces of pipe uh, where the only uh, holes are the actual service connections or connections with other lengths of pipe. And then last but not least, PVC. You probably see these on construction sites all over the place. Um, this is used for water as well. Um, it's flexible. It's resistant to almost everything in wastewater. Typically uses those uh, gasket uh, bell and spigot joints. You can use solvent welding for small stuff. Uh, but again, like every other plastic pipe, uh, it is subject to damage from heavy loads. As I've been going through this, you probably noticed uh, a common refrain, rubber gasket, bell and spigot. That's sort of the typical joint these days. If you got a guess and you're not sure, that's probably the, the, the thing I would pull out because that's the most commonly applicable um, type of joint. Um, there are tables like this. This one happens to be from NMED's Opsert training manual that uh, show you uh, what kinds of joints go with what kinds of pipe. Um, not that you necessarily have to memorize this for the test, but uh, having a good understanding of the typical kinds of joints that you're likely to run into uh, is, is really useful because you can get asked about pretty much any of them. Uh, and just to, to reiterate, that's the bell, that's the spigot, and that's the rubber gasket that goes in between uh, that, that forms the, the seal and the bells face uphill or upstream uh, so that the water is flowing past them and not into them. So now that we know a little bit about pipe, let's talk a little bit about the actual installation. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about insulation in general, uh, specifically uh, bedding and backfill pieces. Um, so sewer lines are typically gonna be excavated, uh, put in excavated trenches. There are a lot of safety rules around excavation. So read up on those. We're gonna have an entire session on uh, sort of OSHA and other safety regs related to wastewater. Uh, opsert that you're going to need to know about, uh, but read up. Uh, often state regulations are 
uh, stricter than actual OSHA regulations. That's an instance here uh, in New Mexico is, is that way. There's slightly different rules about uh, trench support uh, that are a little more stringent than, than OSHA's. Um, the last thing you want to have is, you know, crew members crushed in, in cave-ins uh, for excavation. It happens uh, with more frequency than it should. So this is something to definitely be up on. Uh, and when you're doing your job and involved in excavations, you know, pay attention to what's going on around you. Ask why you guys are doing certain things so that you're familiar from a practical standpoint. Um, because again, that practical experience is really, really useful uh, when you get down to the exam and ask you a question, you can sort of pull out the, well, we do it like this because we're doing it the right way. Um, things to understand about excavation. Um, obviously, you've got to locate nearby utilities. Uh, you know, everything seems to be in the street these days, water, uh, you know, internet lines, electricity, whatever. Um, you've got to locate all that stuff before you start digging. Uh, typically, it's a 48 hour notice uh, requirement, but again, check your state and your mileage may vary. Uh, and the difference between what is, you know, should be done and how fast uh, one call can typically respond in your area may be a little bit different as well. Uh, and it's important to make sure that everything has been located before you start digging because you're basically working in a you break it, you buy it environment. Um, if things aren't located, uh, you know, the digger, and the employer are potentially liable for damages, which which can be astronomic if you're thinking about, um, you know, the, the cost of water lines and other kinds of uh, utility lines that might be buried. Um, typically, most of excavation is going to be doing done with backhoes, uh, just as a practical practical matter. That being said, uh, trenchless technologies are becoming more and more common, uh, even for larger diameter uh, lines. Uh, we're not going to go into this much more than to mention the different kinds that there is. There's, you know, pipe lining, which is uh, is a way of essentially pulling a lining into, into a deteriorating pipe to give it some extra life. Pipe bursting, which is essentially pulling a plug through uh, that's breaking the existing pipe as it goes and, and dragging a, a replacement pipe in behind it. And then there are boring and micro tunneling options uh, where you're essentially digging pits uh, and using machine to bore between and install the pipe, uh, which can become useful in you know, high traffic areas and things like that because you don't have to excavate the entire trench. Um, whenever you're doing pipe instruction uh, installation, you know, make sure you read manufacturer's instructions. Um, you know, use machinery when or where it's appropriate. You know, smaller diameter plastic pipes can pretty safely be uh, moved by hand. Uh, but the big stuff, you know, you need machinery. Again, there's a, there's a lot of safety things around that. Um, and once again, the bells face upstream. Moving on to sort of the, the second uh, installation topic, uh, bedding and backfill, it's really critical. One of the, the common reasons for pipe failure is uh, incorrect installation. Pipe has to be bedded. Uh, typically, you're going to use crushed rock or aggregate. Sand and pea gravel can be used uh, if it's compacted. Um, if native material is going to be used, which often it, it has to be, um, you've got to be really careful about making sure that the grade is absolutely correct. Um, and no matter what you do, uh, the sides, the bottom of the trench and the sides have to be bedded, uh, particularly with plastic pipe, but basically for anyone, because as weight gets pushed down on the top of the pipe, it wants to oval out. And if it's not supported on the sides, it can, can uh, deflect into an oval shape, or if it's a, a rigid pipe, potentially bend or break. Um, <clears throat> so that compacting really affects the loads that pipe can carry. Um, and then if you are using uh, the bell and spigot joint uh, type of pipe, you have to recognize that the bell itself is wider than the diameter of the pipe sections in between it. So you have to uh, remove some bedding material so that that has room. Uh, the last thing you want to do is have it perfectly flat and have the joints, which are the most vulnerable part of the pipe, uh, be deflected because you didn't leave space for them. Um, sort of three elements to the backfill piece of it. This is, you know, pipes bedded and we're, we're filling in the ground above it. Um, it's there to protect the pipe from movement and being broken and crushing, crushed. Um, backfill has to be compacted in layers until the trench is full. Um, because if you just filled it in and tried to compact everything from the top, it wouldn't work. Um, and then once everything is layered in, uh, the ground surface, of course, has to get restored back to whatever that happens to be, you know, pavement, asphalt, uh, whatever. We're kind of working our way backwards here from the streets to the to the service connections. Um, 
need to know how, uh, how the wastewater is getting from your customer to your laterals and mains, um, which again is typically going to be in the street. It's going to look something like this little diagram here, um, although it's not necessarily going to go straight into a manhole. Um, typically, the connections will be made somewhere along the main. Um, and again, this is one of those areas where uh, you run into all kinds of different materials because service connections are put in at a variety of times. Uh, and in some cases, you know, the connections are relatively shallow. In other cases, like that one on the, the left there, uh, or excuse me, the right there, it's it's very deep. Mine here in Albuquerque, even though Albuquerque is not particularly uh, mountainous terrain, um, it's over 15 feet deep. Uh, so um, again, those OSHA regs come into play. Um, things to know about service connections are the kinds of materials you're going to see, which we talked about in the pipes, um, and also how they are connected to uh, your laterals and or mains, you know, commonly known as taps. There's a couple of different versions that you're likely to see. Uh, Clamp-on saddle tees, insertion wise and tees. Uh, you might see epoxy bonded saddle tees uh, or synthetic rubber wedged inserts where essentially a hole is cut in the pipe and there's a, a rubber wedge that holds the pipe in there. The common thing with all of these is that the seal has to be really tight for a couple of reasons. One, you want to prevent infiltration, which is, you know, water coming from outside uh, the sewer and into it. And you also just wouldn't want dirt and things like that to fall in. And you also want to protect it from, from root intrusion. Second thing to be conscious of is that <clears throat> uh, you want that connection to essentially be more or less flush. You don't want a big piece of uh, uh, customer pipe sticking into uh, the main uh, or the lateral and having uh, being a place where uh, things can back up uh, and, and cause cause problems. So the sewers, building sewers cannot protrude into uh, the mains that they're connected to. Another key component is manholes. Uh, Got to know the basics about what they are, how they're built, and, and what you use them for. Um, you know, they're typically installed in lateral main and interceptor sewers, and they're there for maintenance and cleaning. Uh, and because they're there for maintenance and cleaning, there's sort of a limited distance between them, typically no more than 300 or 500 feet apart, might even be shorter in some instances. Um, and that's essentially limited by the length of cleaning equipment. Uh, anything over 500 feet, you really wouldn't be able to clean from downstream under most circumstances. There's a lot of different materials that manholes can be made of, uh, particularly uh, depending on where you are and how old your infrastructure is. You might have you know, brick manholes, you could have fiberglass ones, they could be precast concrete barrels uh, that are kind of these, you know, uh, interlocking bits, kind of like IKEA tools that you can sort of put together on site. You might have ladders, they might have steps. Um, it's a good idea to sort of understand the basic components uh, and, and what they do, particularly for, for uh, precast concrete manholes, as those are typically what's used uh, <clears throat> these days. There's sort of six parts you need to, to understand. Um, this diagram here that you're looking at is from that Sacramento State Manual that we talked about uh, in the first session. Um, you know, typically a precast concrete uh, uh, manhole will have a port in place base, uh, which will have you know slope bench and maybe channels for directing flow. There's going to be an inlet and an outlet. Uh, where flow comes in and out of the barrel. Those have to be sealed. Again, you're uh, wanting to prevent leakage in and out. Um, there will be barrel sections, which you can kind of see here, um, that are pre-made and fit together. Uh, those have to be sealed as well, typically with some sort of mortar or bituminous material. Um, at the top, there's going to be a concentric cone or an eccentric cone section uh, to get in. You know, manholes are typically much larger on the inside than they are at the, at the lid. Um, there's going to be level adjustment rings because you want to be able to uh, continue to level those as maybe a new pavement and things like that gets brought in. And then on the top, there's going to be a cast iron ring uh, with a cast iron lid uh, to seal that off. So you should be able to identify at least those six components of, of, of the manhole. Um, you know, this is, I'm sure you're all familiar with what they look like. This happens to be uh, the, a shot of, of one kind of manhole. Uh, and the reason I'm showing you this is because of the deterioration that you see. There are often corrosive gases inside sewers. You know, we talked about sulfuric acid contributing to crown rot. The same thing can happen uh, in manhole barrels uh, where you end up getting, you know, rusted metal rings uh, and deterioration uh, and slime and things like that on the side. So, if you are in a, in a manhole, be aware of that and, and be careful in there. Um, 
manholes also subject to OSHA rules because they're confined spaces. Um, they've got limited uh, openings for entry and exit. Uh, there's unfavorable ventilation in there. You know, deadly gases can accumulate inside there. Um, there have been multiple instances of workers uh, getting sick or, or worse uh, by descending into manholes without you know proper proper care being taken um you know obviously they're not designed for continuous worker occupancy um so osha rules apply there may be state level uh regulations as well in new mexico those OSHA operations uh regulations are covered under the officer test uh your state may have the same thing um you know they're kind of the overall arching safety uh agency in the country so it's a good to be aware of the, the regulations that pertain uh, to confined spaces uh, and you know trenches effect effectively are the same thing. Um, but again, we'll cover that in, in uh, a separate session. Um, moving on to some sort of you know operations issues, repairs issues, uh, information that you want to know about. Um, basically what we're talking about here is cleaning and maintenance. You know, sewers get blocked, they require regular cleaning, solids, scum, grease, root intrusion, buildup. Um, and depending on where you are, the methods that are used to uh, do that cleaning uh, could have as much to do with tradition as economics. Um, you know, it's the equipment that you have or the way things have been done in your area uh, that people are taught on. But you need to sort of have a, a solid understanding of the basic tools uh, and the different types of cleaning and maintenance that are going to get done. Um, so what we're talking about here is, you know, hydraulic cleaning options, uh, preventive maintenance that gets done. Uh, rotting, which can be done by hand or by machine, and then how you're dealing with actual stoppages, um, you know, where the water's not flowing, the sewage isn't flowing, and, and it has to be maintained or cleaned up uh, and repaired. And that could be just because it's blocked, or it could be actually because of a collapse where you might need to replace some pipe. Um, let's talk a little bit about hydraulic cleaning. Um, so hydraulic cleaning machines, sometimes called jet rotters, essentially use high velocity water to scour debris loose and move it to a manhole where it can get sucked out, usually with a vacuum device. Um, all of this cleaning is basically done downstream, upstream, toward any blockage that's available. Um, jet rotters are pretty common. They can be truck or trailer mounted. They'll typically have a water supply tank, a high pressure pump, sometimes an auxiliary engine for driving it, or it might be a power takeoff. Um, and you know, trucks can usually hold maybe 500 feet of one inch diameter hose, which gets to that uh, issue of placement of um, manholes. The last thing you would want is manholes 600 feet apart and 500 feet of hose. It would make it very difficult to do your job. Um, they will often have different kinds of attachments for the ends, depending on what kind of job you're doing. They're really good with things like, you know, scouring grit and debris and grease off of pipes not so good with roots although they may have root cutting attachments that are specifically designed for that um, and again you're going to be doing this from downstream rotting upstream toward blockage um, the oldest method of cleaning sewers is effectively hand rotting you know um, using some sort of uh, spring steel coil or detachable rod with with a, a fitting on the end and manually uh, moving it back and forth to, to clear out blockages uh, because it's manual uh, you're essentially working on, you know, person power to, to do this. Um, the limits uh, of length of, of hand rods are usually 100 feet or less. Um, really useful where sewer access is limited because the pipe, you know, sections are often in, in bits and you can take them down, sort of assemble them as you go, uh, kind of like a well drilling rig and then pull the pieces out as well. Uh, but again, because a person is going to be doing the work, uh, there's a limit to, to what you can do with hand rotting. Um, there's also power rotters, uh, which are essentially, you know, mechanically rotated steel rods or flexible cables uh, that are kind of like uh, the, the hydraulic versions in that they might be stored on a real cage powered by a truck or a motor or a small engine. Um, if you're doing rotting, you're typically doing that in combination with hydraulic cleaning uh, afterwards to restore the flow to make sure that all the stuff that you've cut up uh, and, 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 and dealt with with the rotter is flushed out and down and cleared away. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of rotting tools and attachments. You're not going to be required typically to know what all of them are, but it's a good idea to have a, a basic understanding of what options there are because you know, your system may not have all of these or need all of these. Um, these are some images again from that so SAC state manuals. Um, the 
you know, state training materials may have uh, images as well and descriptions of the kinds of uh, rotting tools that are typically used in your area that they're concerned about. Um, so we've been talking about how to clean blockages. Um, you know, what are you likely to run into? All sorts of stuff. Um, you know, fog is really common, but it's really amazing uh, what people manage to put into sewers uh, and end up blocking things, you know, roots, junk, towels, all sorts of things. Um, we'll go into the whole list of, of what could be down there, um, but realize that, you know, you have to be adaptable because there's a lot of different kinds of things that you can run into. Um, the cleaning and maintenance that you do is typically going to fall into sort of three large categories. There's the preventative maintenance that you're doing, uh, which is, you know, ongoing maintenance to prevent block blockages from happening uh, and to keep things clean. Um, there's going to be emergency clearing, which is essentially those blockages where you're using your, your equipment to go in there and you know, clean the blockage out uh, and, and vacuum uh, the debris out. And then there's the emergency repairs uh, where there's actually something wrong with the collection system itself. You know, pipe is broken, there's been a collapse uh, and pipe sections need to uh, be replaced. So those are kind of like the three sort of escalating uh, uh, areas of, of cleaning and maintenance that you should, should be aware of. Um, you know, preventative maintenance, again, it's cleaning to avoid blockages, you know, the line cleaning, chemical treatment, sediment removal. Um, if done regularly, it minimizes problems like backups, odors, uh, lift station call outs, uh, but, you know, nothing's ever perfect. There's always going to be emergencies and the emergency clearing and repairs are stuff to get a non-functional system back into operation. So, you know, the sewer line is blocked, water is backing up, uh, and your goal is to, to get it flowing as soon as possible. Um, you know, uh, step one is always finding the best method to fix the problem at hand. And this is why keeping maintenance records and things like that are really useful uh, because they will give you ideas about the kinds of problems you're likely to run into in different parts of your system uh, so that you can be prepared uh, to deal with those. Um, things that you're gonna wanna consider, you know, prior history of the pipes uh, and cleaning operations if you have them, you know, whether there's new connections or other utility repairs, uh, things like that. I, I worked with a, a system a year or two ago uh, where they were starting to have problems in a section of pipe and it turned out uh, that the phone company had come through and installed uh, new uh, telephone poles without uh, doing any checking and they actually ran the telephone pole right through the middle of the sewer line. So, um, you know, what other people are doing around your equipment can often be uh, uh, help point you toward uh, the kinds of issues. But then there's also things like, you know, sinkholes and settlement and indentation, surface indications of, of what might be going on. Um, the reason that I'm talking about this is uh, basically trying to emphasize that it's a really good idea, even if you're a very, very small system, to keep records of repairs and maintenance so that uh, you can start to see those patterns occur, uh, drifting a little bit off of the, the Opsert exam here, but and more into sort of general maintenance. But records are really important. Um, you may be asked about them, you know, but from a practical standpoint, you know, recording where and when things happened, why things happened, um, you know, the nearest manhole ID, line size, and amount of type and uh, type of material that's been removed can be really useful because you can use that information to inform your preventive maintenance uh, to avoid these emergencies. Uh, Basic fact to remember, cleaning takes place from downstream of the blockage. Um, you know, another reason why you wanna keep up on the maintenance so you don't wanna try and scuba dive and clean at the same time. Uh, you wanna minimize the amount of, of stuff you have to deal with. Um, and when you're doing the cleaning, you know, the goal is to essentially clean from a manhole and, and remove the material from that manhole. You don't want the blockage moving further downstream because then you just have to repeat the process. Um, in some cases, particularly for very large blockages that may be have been going on for a while, um, you may need to notify your wastewater treatment plant um, that something is coming. Uh, you know, a large blockage basically gets rid of that airspace above uh, the 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 flow that we talked about earlier. That can lead to uh, septic water going septic, um, which can have a really negative impact on. Uh, the treatment plant itself because, you know, you're relying on biologicals to, to do a lot of the treatment and septic water, if they're not aware that it's coming, uh, can kill that and mess up your treatment. Uh, so, you know, when you are run into large blockages, it's a good idea to let the treatment plant know what's coming. Uh, another component you really need to understand is lift stations, even if your particular system does not have them. Um, <clears throat> basically, what you need to know is the components, 
basic preventive maintenance operations to do that, how lift stations work, uh, and the typical layout, because there are sort of two standard op options for, for lift stations. Um, so what do lift stations do? They lift wastewater from lower to higher elevations. If you remember from our diagram before, I was contemplating a neighborhood that's at a lower elevation from the wastewater treatment plant. You got to get the water up to that plant. Lift stations are one of the ways that you do that, um, essentially using pumps to move water into force mains uh, to go up, uh, up the grade. And once the grade has been uh, surmounted, gravity mains take back over uh, and gravity does, uh, does the rest. Um, there's a lot of reasons for installing lift mains. Uh, a big one being the cost of excavation to maintain slope. You know, you got to maintain that scouring velocity and depending on where your neighborhood is, uh, you know, you might end up having to do uh, really, really deep trenches. And uh, so to avoid that cost, sometimes it makes sense to just install lift stations periodically to essentially, you know, get back the grade uh, that you need uh, so that you're not having to dig, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet into the ground. Um, other reasons, soil instability, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, di uh, or high water tables, you know, digging deeply might not be an option. Um, and it just might be a, a current flow levels. Um, when lift stations are being designed, the goal is basically maximum efficiency, you know, moving the water with maximum efficiency. Pumps have to get selected to avoid uh, surges and minimize them as much as possible. The whole idea is to provide as constant a flow as possible. Um, and then from sort of a, an aesthetic point of view, uh, typically they, you know, the customers are going to want them to blend in um, with surrounding areas. And obviously uh, lift stations are a potential area where uh, you know, for noise and rubbish and, and odors. Um, so, you know, keep them on the maintenance list because you want to avoid having to deal with those kinds of problems. Um, there are two kinds of lift stations. Uh, they generally fall into two categories. There's a dry well version that has two chambers. One has the wastewater in it and the other has all the pumps and the equipment. And then there's a wet well option, which is essentially a single chamber where the pumps are typically, or the motors at least are typically above the wastewater. And there are benefits and drawbacks to each design. We're not gonna go into that, but typically you just have to understand you know, the basics of the two different kinds uh, of designs. Um, have an understanding of the components of a lift station. There's going to be pumps. There's always going to be a wet well. There might be a dry well. Um, there's going to be hardware in there. There's going to be bar racks uh, to prevent you know, large debris from going in and blocking pumps. There's going to be valves, electrical systems, alarms, typically some sort of motor, motor control center that's going to turn things on and off. Um, there are going to be recorders in there to record uh, when it's going on and off and how it's being used. And then there's going to be pump, pump controls. And then obviously the force mains themselves that the pumps would feed. Uh, so get a good idea of how those function, uh, know what they do. Um, and, and, you know, you kind of need to dig into this a little bit. So as for example, in the category of hardware, lift station hardware typically is high grade aluminum or stainless steel. And the reason for that is to prevent corrosion. Most lift stations have three phase electrical systems and backup generators. So that's the, the level of detail that at least you should uh, be aware of as you're going in uh, to your OPSERT uh, training or excuse me, testing. Um, there's often something about maps in the test. Uh, so you're not usually, usually a very big section of it, um, but maps are really important in your day-to-day -day job. So it's important to, to understand them. Um, <clears throat> there are typically, you know, two sets of maps that you might be working with that are based on construction plans. Um, there are working plans that guide construction and theoretically after the project is done, there should be an as-built plan that reflects every deviation from the working plan. So, you know, the first one is what we wanted to build and the second one is how we actually built it. Um, quite often uh, you end up with some combination of the two. Um, you know, the as-built are supposed to be the true record uh, but recognize that there may be problems uh, with them. And as you're working and notice issues, it's good to document them. Um, you know, the as-built are your friends, not having them leads to all sorts of headaches. Uh, if your system doesn't have accurate maps, uh, that's something to focus on trying to get. Um, another category of information that you need to know about are what's called I&I, &I, which is inflow um, which and infiltration. Uh, inflow is water flowing into openings that are supposed to be there. You know, the water itself isn't supposed to be going into them, but it's flowing into them. So 
Uh, if you've got a combined storm sewer system, that might be water from the storm system that's overflowing. Or if you've got open manholes, that might be flood water going down the manholes and into your sewer system. Um, infiltration, on the other hand, is water infiltrating into the pipe in ways that it shouldn't be. Uh, and you know, this is an example. Uh, here you can see all those wet spots and uh, in the sides of the walls where water is coming through uh, defects. So uh, understand the definitions. You know, inflow is water that's entering through manholes and also potentially illegal connections. You know, it's, it's, uh, and then infiltration is is groundwater that's essentially entering the sewer through breaks and joints or broken manhole or barrels. And the reason those are important to know is because chances are the wastewater treatment plant uh, was designed uh, is is designed to handle the regular flow. Um, and you know, if I and I are significant, they can actually cause hydraulic overflow periodically uh, at the wastewater treatment plant where essentially because of a big storm event, for example, there's a lot more water coming into the plant than they're expecting. Uh, so you know, one of the goals uh, in dealing with I and I is to limit uh, inflow and infiltration whenever possible. Uh, recognize that identifying it can be complex and costly. Uh, some basic methods that are used for this are smoke testing, uh, cameraing, you know, CCTV inspection, uh, late night service, um, you know, basically checking the, the manholes in the middle of the night when everybody's asleep and seeing if there's flow. And then flow record analysis can be used as well. You don't need to know too much about these typically for a level one exam, but you have to at least understand uh, what methods might be used for I, &I uh, identification. And quite frankly, sometimes it is difficult to tell which one you're dealing with uh, from uh, uh, fr from the, the flow itself. Um, there's a lot of different ways to control it. Um, many are very, very expensive, like actually replacing pipe or doing slip lining, sometimes chemical grouting, uh, sometimes, you know, it's a matter of sort of bifurcating a storm sewer system that, that flows in uh, to the wastewater system. Um, often is going to require outside contractors. This is not typically something that, that the operation crew is actually going to deal with. Um, but uh, at least with regard to manholes themselves, um, this is something that correction crews can often deal with, you know, because you have access to those. Sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, raising rings so that when water flowing down, it's flowing down the street, it's not flowing into the holes, <coughs> repairing joints and things like that. So that is a very quick and dirty uh, overview of collection systems and some kinds of things that you're going to need to know for your exam. Uh, before we open the floor for questions, and I haven't been able to check and see if there are any in there, uh, I've got a couple sample questions that you might run into on the exam that we can run into, uh, run through. So uh, Avery, if you wouldn't mind firing those up, one, two, three, uh, and we'll see how folks do. Thanks to our first poll question. Um, <clears throat> this one asks, which pipe types commonly use rubber gasketed bell and spigot joints? The options are cast iron, PVC, reinforced concrete, or all of the above. I'm gonna leave it up for a couple more seconds. It's like about um, seventy five percent have responded. And I'm going to close the poll in three, two, one. So it looks, looks like the most common answer was all of the above, followed by PBC. Yeah, so basically all the answers are correct, but one of them is a little more correct than the others. <laughs> uh, so let's move on to the second question. For question number two, it asks, what are the two lift station design types? Um, and the options are left well and right well, wet well and dry well. This is quite the tongue twister. <laughs> High well and low well, or in well and out well. Uh, 
Okay, so it looks like most responses are in. So I'm going to go ahead and, and close this one. Um, and it looks like the results are pretty unanimous with wet well and dry well. Yep, those indeed are the two. Uh, I can see how the high well and, and, and low well thing might be confusing because in a, in a, in a wet well only system, the, the equipment is often above, uh, but there are the two basic design types are wet and dry. Uh, and we'll run our last question and then open the floor. For our last question, we ask, what is inflow? The options are groundwater entering the sewer through breaks, joints, et cetera, water entering through manholes and illegal connections, water entering the wastewater treatment facility, or all of the above. All right, get your answers in. We're going to close the poll shortly. I'm going to close it in three, two, one. That looks like the top answer was uh, option B, so water entering through manholes and illegal connections. Yeah, and, that, and, that, that's, and that's uh, in, uh, entering through manholes and illegal connections is uh, the correct answer a good way to sort of differentiate between inflow and infiltration inflow is flowing through holes that should be there or arguably could be there like an illegal connection uh you know could is similar to a regular connection whereas uh infiltration you can kind of think of it as sneaking in where it's not supposed to go in um and so things like breaks and joints and things like that um, are where the infiltration happens uh so overall Pretty good on on the whole questions there. Um, did we have any questions come in uh, over uh, or comments come in over the uh, polls there? Let's see. So yeah, we have uh, a, a few one. comments and then a question at the end. Uh, right. So looking at these, yeah, one call isn't necessarily true in all jurisdictions, which is, is true. Uh, it is here in New Mexico. There may be other places that you, you need to, to reach out to. Um, and again, this is why, you know, before each one of these, uh, we emphasize making sure that you check, uh, you know, local customs and requirements because they sometimes do vary. Um, let's see, what else do we got? Okay, we've got a, let's see. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, start with James. Uh, AJ, you on the line? Uh, can you give a brief description of a line going septic? Like what's going on there? Yeah, so typically a line's gonna go septic um when there is not enough oxygen um there's not enough um, like turbulence in the um line so uh that could be either due to a blockage or just very very slow flow and so when it becomes um septic it starts to approach uh, anaerobic conditions so without oxygen and you'll have that anaerobic decomposition which can negatively affect your um, biological process, and you can also get like you'll start to get floating material and stuff like that. All right. Um, so, um, uh, Brett uh, said you'd mentioned low pressure sewer systems when talking about HDPE pipe, but said you shouldn't have uh, pressurized sewer. Can I elaborate? Um, there's actually two kinds of pipes uh, that you're gonna gonna run into potentially in a sewer system. The gravity mains were essentially slope and gravity, basically physics are what's moving uh, the water. And then uh, pressure mains, uh, which are typically gonna be connected to lift stations. Uh, so you're gonna have sections of pressurized pipe uh, that are essentially moving the water uphill. Those are gonna be full typically. Uh, and then those will at some point then typically 
uh, empty out into a gravity main so that gravity uh, can take over. Um, so, um, you know, it's not that that you can't have a pressurized sewer. Um, what you what you want is, you know, pressurized sewers uh, where the design uh, it calls for it. So where you've got, for example, a lift station, you don't want uh, sections of pipe that are designed uh, as gravity flow that should be running at a maximum of about a half full. Uh, becoming pressurized because of a blockage basically by that i mean they're filling up and pressure is building up behind it because if that happens then we run into what aj was just talking about uh which is uh potential septic uh, sewer system uh and you know all the negative consequences that go along with that so i hope that clarified things a little bit um uh let's see and then we've got a comment from steve i can't understand why our submersible pumps in the wet well area have regular chains and guides instead of stainless steel hardware um that's something you can comment on aj i would have i would expect that that kind of equipment to be stainless steel i mean honestly i would just say it's probably a design issue um i wouldn't you know why do we do we do it uh you know replace those materials and do the design without taking into account corrosion Right. Yeah, it's it's possible that maybe pumps got replaced. You know, the the original one had stainless steel, and when it was replaced, it was replaced with one that doesn't have uh, stainless steel equipment. So, but again, you know, it's a, a good point. Um, you basically got uh, a maintenance and replacement issue there uh, because of you know what what the equipment is made out of. Um, let's see. I think. Let's see. Uh, what signs do you put around a manhole to keep the public out? <laughs> that is a really good question. Um, uh, I think typically people just know not to go in them. Um, and I have seen locking manholes before. Um, are, are there any specific things that uh, Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority does to keep people out of? manholes or is that an issue that that you guys ever ran into while you were there uh if we had a manhole where people were just constantly trying to get in there and stuff um well, they, they'd lock it they you know there's devices that you can put on there that can lock them um i mean most people don't mess with them um uh, i don't think it's a yeah most people know to avoid it. it's kind of a common sense thing um i don't know if darwin's lock could take over i don't know <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, so, you know, typically signage, probably not necessary, but, you know, locking mechanisms would probably be a good idea for areas that you have uh, uh, continued intrusion in if somebody really, really likes getting in the sewer, I guess. Uh, and I guess our last, our last question here that I see, or one of the last ones, um, from Michael, can you describe what a head gate is? And this is directed at you, AJ. Um, I am not familiar with that term. Um, would you could you maybe put in the chat, elaborate a little more? Are you talking about the physical barrier that that is stopping large debris from flowing in? Or like an influent gate for the headworks? That's probably what, what we're talking about, would be my guess. Um, you know, so typically for, um, you know, some uh, like, you know, larger plants, but also package plants, you might have a gate at the influent uh, where the collection system comes in. Um, and that can be used either for, for diversion or, you know, temporarily stopping the flow. Um, and it's basically just a uh, like a gate that's run with um, you know uh, an automatic or uh, you know mechanical means to bring up and bring down the gate that will just you know can change or um, transfer flow if that's what we're talking about. Um, I'm not positive. I, I guess the other thing we could potentially be talking about is is some version of like a, a large scale bar screener or something like that to keep keep things out. Yeah, uh, in that case, it's, oh. oh, uh, and then uh, Donovan, you asked about professional development hours. We have not pre-submitted this. 
uh, anywhere, uh, but a copy of the slides you can download and you will be getting an attendance certificate um, after this. Uh, I think they come out typically a couple of weeks afterwards. Uh, so you can take that and self submit uh, to your to your organization. Um, that's not something that we typically do, but we will provide you the information. And if for some reason they need uh, a little bit more information, like an agenda or something, uh, feel free to reach out. I forgot to put our contact information up here. Um, you can reach out uh, to us. Uh, and, and we could provide some additional description if that if that's necessary. But typically, you know, the slides uh, and the certificate and the description from yourself will be good enough. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, looks like we're a couple of minutes over. Um, the uh, contact information you've got AJ's there, you've got mine, and we haven't introduced you to Rose yet, but she will be doing uh, some of the operator uh, math. Uh, related uh, sessions that we do going forward. Um, she's our sort of resident math teacher. Um, and uh, so, you know, feel free to reach out to any of us uh, about these topics as we go through. Um, is there anything else uh, that we can throw out here? Um, how many kilowatts or hertz is a locator, pipe locator? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, Michael, if you wouldn't mind, just email one of us uh, after the session with a, a slightly uh, elaborated description of what you're asking there, uh, and we'll get back to you on that. Um, I think we should end the session now. We're a little bit over time. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, and we'll see you the next time. I can't remember exactly what our next topic is. I believe it's basic treatment, um, but uh, that, that'll be listed on our uh, EFCN website. Um, you'll be able to register for that the same place uh, that you registered for this. Uh, and again, if something comes up after this, you know, something occurs to you after the session is over, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, and again, for the technical assistance uh, that we talked about, that's something you can get uh, through the EFCN website, or you can reach out to us specifically if you've got some sort of technical managerial or financial issue uh, that you think we can help with. So thank you all for attending uh, and enjoy the rest of your days. Real quick, I just want to follow up with that by saying thank you to, to James and for AJ for participating today and for presenting with us. Um, and I see a few questions about recordings and um, and slides. So following this webinar, you will receive a follow-up email with the slides and a link to the recording. Um, you also have a, well, there will be an evaluation that will pop up automatically. So we ask you to let us know your thoughts on today's session, and we'll use that to plan some future webinars that, um, that will be on topics important to you. So thank you again. And um, I see some additional follow-up questions coming in now, but we'll follow up with those after the session. So thank you and, and have a great rest of your day. All right. Thanks, Avery. Thanks, AJ. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.